I wanted to talk about today, which was, I mean, there are many paths into this, but about the paradigm shift. And we've talked now for a few minutes about natural law versus the idea that the universe is some kind of organism. And um, I want to talk about two opposed sets of terms. The old paradigm and what it implied and how it worked and the new paradigm and how it's different and what it implies and how it works because I, re I think we're getting close to pay dirt on this great change of consciousness thing that enough data is accumulating enough global web weaving is happening uh, uh, that we're close to criticality on having the new paradigm emerge here are the terms first of all old paradigm freedom and law this is what it's about freedom and law this great opposing and dichotomous set of concepts first the laws of nature eternal platonic suspended in some philosophical superspace beyond argument uh, beyond contradiction and then the, the mystery of freedom, that man is free and therefore responsible and therefore somehow bears a measure of uh, guilt for the historical predicament. So human freedom is the precondition for the assumption of man's flaw, man's fall. And these ideas of law and freedom have been worked out since the late 17th century when after the Cromwellian Revolution was disposed of and Newton published the Principia in England, people like John Locke and Hume and uh, Thomas Hobbes began to work out the social implications of all this while Newton and Leibniz and Fibonacci and so forth worked out the implications of the law part of it and created science as we know it, practice it, love it, hate it today. Okay, now the new paradigm. A paradigm is a lens through which you see the world and everything is transformed when you look through this lens. Your food, your religion, your sexuality, your science, your economics, everything is transformed. And for 500 years, let's say, we have looked at the world through the lens of freedom and law. And, and our whole social dialogue has been how can we have as much freedom as possible and law and what is law and what is freedom and this is what the dialogue has been about since uh, the Renaissance habit and novelty are the the new or what I would propose as the two concepts that are rising out of a synthesis of 20th century experience as uh, the new defining terms of a universal paradigm. And first I want to talk about habit. The problem is the eternality of the ideas and their supraordinary, the supraordinary ontos of their existence, as a philosopher would say. In other words, that they are nowhere to be found in what we call the world. They are like with God or, 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 or with the square root of minus one or something like that. Um, so habit, rather than law, has the curious effect of invigorating the universe and making it not something static like a piece of furniture or as Newton imagined it a divine clock a machine set going to the last tick of eternity but if habit is to replace law then the universe is more like an organism it's more like a creature it learns it gains experience as it 
matures, it changes its strategy. As it expands its experience, it gains new domains of emergent subtlety. Uh, And this is, in fact, what we see. Apparently, each episode of becoming rather than stabilizing itself like a machine would, it actually becomes the foundation for some completely new phenomena. And that's what you call habit? Well, as opposed to law. I think law allows freedom because freedom means you go outside of law. But law doesn't allow novelty exactly. That's a slightly different concept. So if you take seriously this idea that the concept of law can be replaced by the idea of habit, then suddenly you're not in a Newtonian machine, a soulless cuckoo clock of of natural laws. What you're inside is an organism. And since you are an organism, there is suddenly an enormous dimension for empathy. You can understand then, aha, I feel, I strive, I know hope and disappointment, and I can therefore transfer these qualities to the dynamic of the world around me. And this is very important. Again, recall that what we're talking about is why one paradigm replaces another. This is very important for us as a species to get in contact with what we've done to the planet. If the planet is a thing you can basically use it. If it's an organism, then you must relate to it the way you would relate you know, to another person or at least to a fine animal or something like that. And this is probably the most controversial part of all this. Um, it was very important when this freedom and law dichotomy was set up there every paradigm has a hidden or secret agenda and what lies behind this freedom and law thing is uh, Christian ethics it's very important in Christian ethics to maintain the idea of human freedom because man cannot fall and be redeemed without the dimension of human freedom And the dimension of human freedom is a precondition for guilt. Only the free can be guilty because only the free are responsible for what they do. You know, after all, if the universe is a determinism, then you do what you do because you couldn't do anything else. And so to expect you to take responsibility for that is a little weird. So it was very important to establish the idea of human freedom. And all our political systems are built on various adumbrations of this concept of freedom. Habit and novelty is a little a shift slightly east on this issue. There's a lot less freedom in the habit and novelty equation and there's a lot less responsibility. And responsibility, you know, Wei Po Yang, the 9th century Chinese alchemist, said worry is preposterous. Worry is preposterous. And then the exegesis explains that in order to worry, you have to know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, worry is an absurd... I mean, it's like someone who knows nothing about automobiles worrying that their car may break down. it's, It's immaterial. So, freedom is a very touchy subject, and I offer this in an exploratory manner. There are very respectable orthodox positions which would tell you that the creation of the ideal of human freedom and the way in which it has been enshrined and defended in Western political institutions is the crowning achievement of the civilization. The problem is it has a curious relationship to other important power concentrations the community and the ego 
you know, where does freedom lie in that spectrum? When, when we say, if you are a Jeffersonian Democrat, a materialist, a paid-up member of the Democratic Party, and you say you are free, you know, do you mean you are free to do whatever you want to do? Or do you mean you are free to uh, participate in the general will of the community? This is not a closed issue. Over the centuries, the answer to that question has shifted. Uh, the 19th century, based on in America, based on the exposure to frontier, frontier hardship and that sort of thing, was much more uh, about the freedom of the community to do what it wanted to do. In the 20th century, uh, consumerism and the disappearing of frontiers and the rise of populations and the packing of populations very tightly has tended, freedom has tended to mean uh, the right to gratify the whims of the ego. And this has led to a whole bunch of anti-communal attitudes and phenomena. Uh, class struggle, consumerism, manufacture of useless and soon-to-be obsolete objects, uh, people trapped in a rat race of media-propagated needs and low salary and, you know, the, the rat race. So the thing from the very beginning that has always puzzled me when people talk about the future was there's a general agreement that it's going to be more collective that, you know, we talk in terms of the Internet, we talk in terms of boundary dissolution, uh, a community, and yet the great metaphor for collectivism is now in ruins, you know, Marxism. I mean, it's finished. And so uh, there is no, no uh, countervailing force to this freedom and law image at the moment. But I think that when community coalesces around the felt need to express community values, then the, the, the paradigm shift will be very close to happening. Now, when will that happen? Things will have to get a lot worse. Because you see, the paradox is that the people who can change the world, people like you and me, the upper 5% of the literate elites of the industrial democracies, we're the furthest away from the bad news. You know, we're getting three squares and having a fine time. So somehow there has to be a sense of danger or impending chaos. And then we will, I hope, organize ourselves to get out of it. So are you saying the organism is reaching a point of transformation that uh, well, would be very painful for many and not so painful for few? Well, I guess that leads to the subject of change. You know, change is in and of itself neither painful nor pleasurable. But, you know, the Bob Dylan song that says, when you got nothing, you got nothing to lose... Well, a lot of people have nothing, and a few people have something. And uh, I think it wouldn't hurt for everybody to lighten their ballast a little bit, uh, to, to float higher. Uh, so these ideas have a lot of implications. A paradigm touches everything, and it begins very deeply. But I think uh, that my you know fractal mathematics chaos theory complexity theory all of this is going to in a sense erase much of the mystery about the future that the future is in a freedom and law system necessarily unknowable because if you knew the future then this idea of freedom would fall under a shadow but if you replace freedom with the idea of novelty and see then that no matter how unique a situation is, it was somehow preceded, announced, anticipated by earlier uh, situations, then the anxiety that is built in to the freedom and law formulation disappears 
Because you see, with the acceptance of this idea of freedom comes the acceptance of an unknown future. Novelty replaces freedom in that freedom is this idea that anything is possible and that you create it. And novelty is the idea that sometimes interesting things are possible and you are more like the gifted recipient. You know, it, it embeds you more. Freedom is an alienating, a fairly alienating concept. This is what ex- modern existentialism understood. You know, that woman, Margaret Green, who wrote that book, Dreadful Freedom, talks about how, you know, once you embrace freedom, uh, uh, a great deal of, of uh, supportive structure fell away, which they, the existentialists embraced as a necessary confrontation with man's situation in the cosmos. But I think they were pessimistic. Sartre's ultimate formulation of all this was he said, nature is mute. Well, nature is not mute. That's ridiculous. How could somebody get so tweaked around as to hold that position? I don't believe it. Nature is not mute. Nature is the available statement uh, for deconstruction on the nature of being. I mean, I see that as a prologue to some kind of fascism. But native peoples, aboriginals, if you could explain these two things, freedom and law, they're not going to get freedom and law. An Amazon tribe wouldn't have a clue. But if you talk about novelty and habit, this they understand. This is what life is to anybody who's paying attention. While freedom and law both are high-flown abstractions that come out of a very special philosophical agenda that by the time Hume and Locke and John Stuart Mill got to it, it was 2,000 years old. The reason I use the word novelty is because I'm a great fan of Alfred North Whitehead, who was probably the last and greatest of of the Platonists. He says there is out of the background of, of what has been emerges the unique. And what we call nature is a novelty conserving engine. That what nature glories in is novelty. You know, the pattern on the butterfly's wing, the color of the polyp, the molecular species of the synapse, the chemical dynamics at the heart of a star. Originally, I called the counterpoise of novelty, logically, I think, entropy, which is a familiar concept in physics, well understood mathematically. But Rupert convinced me that habit was a much more applicable idea. Novelty is easy to understand but hard to define. It's like the word complexity, another word very easy to understand, very hard to define. But intuitively we grasp what this means. Sometimes for novelty I've used the phrase density of connection. Because I think that, you know, like the arborization of the nervous system in the human brain or in the vascular system of a plant, that uh, as many points as can be made cotangential to each other defines the complexity of a system. But it's, it's basically and ultimately an intuitive and poetic concept, which is probably as it, to, as it should be. I mean, for a scientist, here's the real difference between what freedom and law means and what novelty and habit means. The way science has been done since Newton is through probability theory. You get this with Cantor and these people. Probability theory is a very, very necessary tool for science, but it may be a bogus assumption about nature. Let's think about probability theory for a moment. Um, Here's how it works. You want to know how much electricity is flowing through a wire. You carry out a thousand measurements. You add them together. You divide by a thousand. You now say, this is how much electricity is flowing through the line. Well, but it's entirely possible 
that if you look back through the thousand measurements you made, not one will be the same as this average value which you're now holding up and saying is how much electricity is flowing through the line. Not one of your measurements confirms your final conclusion. But people say, well, but, uh, you know, induction and accumulation of sample and averaging. Averaging is what's going on here at the center. And the key to using averaging with intellectual effectiveness is you're making an assumption that's very deep. And the assumption you're making is that time is invariant. Well, that is simply an assumption. Um, It is the centrally untested assumption of science over the past 500 years. Now, let's take something really important. When a, when a compound is created or isolated from nature that has never been created before, one of the first things you do with it is you, as a physical chemist, you determine its melting point. This then goes into a handbook that's published around the world of melting points. Well, the apparatus for doing melting point uh, measurements hasn't changed greatly in a hundred years. Melting points for certain compounds have fluctuated three degrees centigrade. We're not talking thousands of a degree here. We're talking about all over the map kind of stuff. Rupert studied this, you know, got a complete set of the 20th century's published melting points. And, you know, what is chromium dioxide? What did it melt at in 1934? What did it melt at in 1958? and looked at this, made charts showing many melting points rising with the measurements over time, took it to the editors of the publishing house that is in charge of all that. They they were amazed. They hadn't a clue. It's a, a, a complete bafflement unless you believe, you know, that these things are wavering. And that everything is less, you know, not subject to eternal laws. And when you think about it, if you really believe in eternal laws of nature, then you just have a, 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 a philosophical mess on your hands. I mean, where are you going to say the laws of nature were before the universe existed? And don't forget, we're not only talking about laws of physics, that's one thing. What about the laws of gene segregation? Where were they before biology existed? Clearly, we're in a sort of a, a, a loop here of ignorance. So, so the universe is a thing where habit constrains, but novelty overcomes that constraint. And once overcome, new levels of novelty become incorporated into the old set of constraints. So novelty establishes new domains of uh, of constraint and then out of that constraint new novelty emerges and this is a principle which i believe reaches across all the way across the domain of phenomena i mean we're not just simply talking about what goes on in biology we're talking about what goes on in uh, astrophysics biology cultural anthropology, sociology, uh, these principles are universal.